So the first task that we want to tackle is understanding how to use inequalities. Um, inequalities are one road into defining where the real numbers come from in the first place, even if it's not the road that you're ultimately probably going to walk this semester. Um, inequalities are nevertheless going to be very important for us to establish the, the, the theoretical results on which the real numbers in the calculus are predicated. Um, and so we really want to know how to do two things. Um, first of all, how do I solve an inequality? So to determine which values of a variable in an inequality are sufficient, necessary and sufficient to satisfy that inequality. Um, but the second piece, and this is the piece that is too often overlooked coming into a real analysis course, is how do I establish an inequality? How do I prove an inequality? Um, because those are two very different ways of working with inequalities, um, and the latter really turns out to be the one that's the most important for real analysis. Um, so much of what you're going to do this semester involves proving assertions, proving claims. And when those claims involve inequalities, then your job is going to be to prove an inequality. Um, and very often, there's kind of a two-step process, and that's the process I want to talk about together today. The first process for trying to prove an inequality might be to try to solve that inequality. Um, but then the process of actually writing up a proof actually kind of takes those steps and it, and it sort of subverts them, it inverts them a little bit, writes them in a different order. Uh, so we have to kind of adopt a different mental posture when we're proving an inequality compared to when we're solving it. Uh, hopefully by example I'll be able to show you what I'm talking about in just a moment here. So we're going to talk about inequalities first and then the second step is we'll talk about when absolute value comes to the, the party, uh, what do we do with absolute values in an inequality context. So suppose we're given an inequality statement like this one. If n is greater than or equal to 3, then 4 to the n minus 16n is greater than 3 to the n. Now, if you were just handed this thing to prove, if you were just asked to prove this in a, in a previous course, probably what you would have done is something we t didn't really talk too much about, but as part of the, the first uh, section of these review materials, you would probably approach it using a proof by induction. Right. You would say, well, let's see whether or not this inequality holds for n equals 3, that would be the base case, um, and then show that if it holds for any given value of n, then it also must hold for the following value of n, for n plus 1. Right? So probably you would approach this using a proof by induction. Um, but what I want to think about today is maybe a different way to understand how to prove an inequality, maybe not using induction, maybe sort of looking at it in a different way. Um, and so I want to highlight this difference between what it takes to solve an inequality and what it takes to prove an inequality. So my apologies, I switched up the inequality we're going to use here just because the one that we chose before um, doesn't actually have a straightforward algebraic approach to it. This one does, um, and I think it's a good one for us to help illustrate how this process works. Um, so the inequality we'll work with now is 1 over n squared plus n minus 1 is less than 2 over n squared. And so if I want to prove this thing, and I don't want to prove it using induction. I want to try to prove it using things I already know about how inequalities works. Um, probably the thing that I would do is I would try to use what we remember from our algebra classes to try to first solve this inequality. And the thing is that the work that I would do to solve that inequality, what we would want to do is first try to solve this inequality. But that solution is not a proof. And that's the difference I want to stress for today. So typically what will happen is we'll take out a piece of scratch paper or the old mathematician's joke is you take out your cocktail napkin at the bar, right, and a pen. Um, and we do some scratch work to try to solve this inequality and just solve it on paper, right? Um, but then when it comes to actually writing up that proof, how it would look in the, in the finished proof would probably be something different. But let's go through the process of solving this inequality just on paper, just on a scratch piece of paper, uh, and see what it is that, that we can do to, to understand you know, then after that, how the proof might look. So if I want to get this n by itself, probably the first thing I want to do is deal with the fact that I have all my n expressions are in the denominators over here, which is less than ideal, right? Um, so the first thing I might want to do is take both sides of this inequality and apply the reciprocal function to them. Just flip both of those fractions upside down. So I'm just going to kind of write here. I'm applying the function f of x equals 1 over x on both sides of this inequality. Right? Working on both sides of an inequality is something we do want to do when we're solving an inequality. And so if I apply that function to both sides, it's going to turn both of my fractions upside down. I'm going to get n squared plus n minus 1 on the left side. I'm going to get n squared divided by 2 on the right-hand side. But you'll notice that I didn't write any inequality symbol in between those two. 
because here's the first point that I want to make sure I belabor today. Right? That when you're solving an inequality, what we should be thinking about is what function have we applied to both sides in order to go from the first step to the next step. Right? And here, the function we applied was the reciprocal function, f of x equals 1 over x. The problem with the reciprocal function is that it is a decreasing function. Right? If you think about what the graph of 1 over x looks like, it's a decreasing curve as we go from left to right. And so what that means is that if, uh, if x is less than y, and then I apply the reciprocal function to them, then f of x is going to end up being greater than f of y. Right? Decreasing functions, by their very definition, reverse the senses of inequalities. Right? Whatever relationship comparison existed between x and y, after I apply 1 over the reciprocal function, that reciprocal, uh, their reciprocals have the opposite comparison. Right? So decreasing functions reverse the sense of inequalities. So when I apply the 1 over x function to both sides, I have to reverse the inequality symbol. So I know one of the things that happens when you come out of an algebra class where you solve a lot of inequalities is you, a lot of students just end up remembering, oh, we reverse the inequality when we multiply or divide by a negative number, which that's true. But that's because the function, for example, f of x equals negative 3x, if I'm multiplying both sides by negative 3, that function is a decreasing function. That's why that inequality symbol reverses. And when you think in this more expansive frame about when inequalities reverse, any time we apply a decreasing function to both sides, that helps you to catch other situations where we need to reverse the inequality, like this one. OK, so I think I can get off of my soapbox uh, on that, and we can continue with the solution of this. So now probably what I'll do is I'll just multiply both sides by 2. I'll apply the function f of x equals 2x to both sides of this inequality, just to cancel this 2 that's down here in this denominator. Right? But since that's an increasing function, I don't need to reverse my inequality here to get the right-hand side to be n squared. Left-hand side is 2n squared plus 2n minus 2. Right? OK, and then I'll subtract n squared from both sides. f of x equals x minus n squared. Right? I'm just subtracting. That's an increasing function as well. And so I'll just get a 0 on the right. I'll get n squared plus 2n minus 2 over here on this side. So now I've got an inequality. I've got a 0 on the right-hand side. I've got some nice quadratic expression uh, over here on the other side. Um, and so if I want to finish solving this inequality, typically what we do is something like maybe we complete the square um, on this. Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and do that. That's a good example for it. If I complete the square on n squared plus 2n, well, to complete the square, we divide this middle coefficient 2 by 2. So I get 1, and then I square it to get 1. So n squared plus 2n plus 1 minus 1 minus 2, right? So to complete that, oops, sorry, to complete that square, I'll add and subtract 1 down here. Because this expression, n squared plus 2n plus 1, is the perfect square, n plus 1, the quantity squared. And then minus 1 minus 2 is going to be minus 3. All right? So now we've completed the square. I can add 3 to both sides. I'm going to start skipping those steps where I write down the function that we're applying at each stage. Pull out a second cocktail napkin, or unfold this one if I could, if it weren't digital. Um, n, n plus 1 quantity squared is greater than 3. And then I take the square root on both sides. The square root is also an increasing function. If you think about the graph of the square root, it goes like this, right? Um, so it's an increasing function, which means I don't need to reverse my inequality. But on the left-hand side, I have the square root of a perfect square. And the square root of a perfect square does not actually cancel out. This is another point for me to belabor, because the square root of a perfect square is an absolute value. Square root of n plus 1 squared is the absolute value of n plus 1. And so now at this point, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of what we'll talk about when we talk about absolute values in a few minutes, right? When an absolute value of n plus or of a quantity is greater than a certain value, that splits into two different inequalities that are connected by an or. Right? 
On the one hand, we could have the absolute value of n plus 1 be greater than the square root of 3 if n plus 1 itself is greater than the square root of 3. On the other hand, we could have this be true if n plus 1 is less than the opposite of the square root of 3, negative square root of 3. So now that my absolute value is gone, I can finish solving my inequality. Add 1 to both sides of this one over here. Uh, sorry, subtract 1 from both sides. I'll get n greater than the square root of 3 minus 1. Okay. And in the other part, I'll get n is less than minus the square root of 3 minus 1. OK. So I do all of this work on a, on a cocktail napkin to figure out that this inequality is true in the case where n is greater than the square root of 3 minus 1. The square root of 3 is about 1.732. So n would have to be greater than 0 0.732. Talking about decimals, by the way, in a real analysis course is very often gauche. Uh, so I try to avoid talking about decimals for a lot of reasons. Um, but anyway, the point is that um, the statement that we're trying to prove here is we're trying to establish that this inequality holds not for just any values of n, but for those values of n that are greater than or equal to 3. And so if my goal is to try to write a proof of this statement, if I'm writing a direct proof, I can take for granted that my value of n is greater than or equal to 3. And so if n is greater than or equal to 3, then it is in particular also greater than the square root of 3 minus 1. And if it's greater than the square root of 3 minus 1, then we can follow all of this string of inequalities back to establish the thing that we're trying to prove is true. right? Um, and so a direct proof of this might look something like this. So we did all of the work on both sides of the inequality to sort of figure out what the logic would end up looking like. But now when it comes to actually writing down a proof, we want to go back to our understanding of how proofs can be structured. And because I have an if-then statement that's sort of sitting at me here, I've got a conclusion that I want to try to establish. That's like our Q. And I have a premise, a hypothesis, a P, uh, that I want to be able, in a direct proof, to deploy it strategically. If I'm going to do this directly, I'm just going to say, assume that n is greater than or equal to 3. And then we want to show that this green thing is true. So how will we do that? So now I'm going to try to read these notes from the bottom up. Now that I know that n is greater than or equal to 3, I know in particular that n is also greater than the square root of 3 minus 1, just because we know that 3 is greater than the square root of 3 minus 1. Then in particular, n is greater than the square root of 3 minus 1, because 3 is greater than the square root of 3 minus 1. And now I have my hook into this part of my proof, which I'm now going to try to read backwards. Um, so now that I know that n is greater than this number, let me focus in on the inequality that I'm trying to establish. And when we're trying to prove an inequality, what we like to do is we like to work from one side to the other, rather than trying to work on both sides of the inequality. So I'm going to take this left-hand side of my inequality. 1 over n squared plus n minus 1, and try to use what I know about n to make this quantity progressively larger and larger and larger until I end up with 2 over n squared on the other side. So the first thing that I might do is say, if I know that n is bigger than the square root of 3 minus 1, what is going to happen if I place the square root of 3 minus 1 in place of this n in the denominator? Let's think about that for just a moment and think what comparison that we would make if n is replaced by the square root of 3 minus 1 in this denominator. So which of these two is larger? So this n is larger than this square root of 3 minus 1. But what does that tell us about the values of these fractions? Well, what happens to a fraction when I make its denominator smaller. The denominator of a fraction is like bizarro world, right? Anything that happens to change the value of a quantity in the denominator of a fraction is going to have the opposite effect on the whole fraction itself because 1 over x is a decreasing function, right? When I make a denominator smaller, I make the fraction bigger. And so if I replace this n 
with a quantity that is smaller, I'm going to end up with a fraction which is in fact bigger. So this fraction is larger than this fraction because this n is smaller, I'm sorry, because this denominator is smaller than this denominator. So that's the kind of reasoning that you end up doing a lot in trying to write a proof um, using an inequality, right? We now know that we have a fraction which is greater. So we've taken one step to make this quantity into something bigger. Right? And similarly, um, if I replace this n squared by the square root of 3 minus 1, the quantity squared, um, I could also show that that's larger there as well. But I don't want to do that because I'm trying to get to a right-hand side which still has an n squared in the denominator. So I'm going to leave that n squared where it is and just sort of hope that this works out. Okay. So now we know we can simplify a little bit. Minus 1, minus 1. And kind of make that into a minus 2, right? Okay. Um, and we're trying to keep in mind here that we ultimately want to get to, on the right-hand side, 2 over n squared. Right? So we know where we started. We know where we're going. We got rid of this pesky n, which was part of my left-hand side, but which wasn't part of my right-hand side. Right? Um, but we still haven't figured out what to do with this square root of 3 minus 2. Right? Let's think about what would happen if we just got rid of it. Right? If we square root of 3, well, square root of 3 minus 2, hold on. Square root of 3 minus 2 is a negative number, right? And so if I'm adding square root of 3 minus 2 to n squared, I'm adding a negative quantity to n squared. And when I add a negative quantity to something, it makes that something smaller, right? And so in particular, if I were to just forget about this plus square root of 3 minus 2 and just ask, how does it compare to n squared? n squared plus the square root of 3 minus 2 is going to be less than n squared, right? Because this number right here is negative. If I add it to n squared, I'm going to get something which is smaller than n squared, which would seem like a good thing, except remember, we're in, a fr we're in the denominator of a fraction. And so if we try to just forget about that number, we wouldn't end up getting something which is larger than the fraction. We would end up getting something which is smaller than that fraction. And that is exactly the thing that we do not want to do in this process. Because now we've completely lost the tune. Right? 1 over n squared is not, in fact, larger than this quantity. It's smaller. And we don't know whether it's smaller or not than this thing in the middle. 1 over n squared belongs maybe somewhere in between these two. Maybe it belongs over here. We don't know. It's not a good comparison. So anytime we're working from the left toward the right to prove an inequality, we want to always make sure that the inequality symbol that we're able to write down every time is something which always points in the same direction. I can always write a less than. I can write a less than or equal to. I can write an equal to. But the one thing that I can't write down is a greater than. I don't want to do that. So what I want is I want to figure out what is something that this denominator can be greater than. If I figure out something that this denominator can be greater than, then we'll be in great shape. Right? Um, so to figure that out, let's try and work a little bit from the right-hand side of this inequality. Um, one difference I notice is that my numerator is a 2 instead of a 1. So let's try and change this quantity so that my numerator becomes a 1 instead of a 2. I can do that just by dividing the top and the bottom by 2. Just write this as 1 over one-half n squared. Right? That's exactly the same thing as 2 over n squared. So now that my numerators are the same, I can reduce to just a comparison of my denominators. Can I establish that n squared plus the square root of 3 minus 2 is greater than one-half n squared? If I can, then we know that we're going to be done. And so now is a place where an induction proof might actually be helpful. Can we establish that this is true? So to figure that out, let's pull out our pull out a clean napkin and see if we can make that claim. So n squared plus the square root of 3 minus 2, which is a negative number. I want to know whether this can be greater than 1 half n squared. So to figure this out, we'll again do the same solve an inequality process that we did before. I'll multiply both sides by 2 just to clear that fraction. That's an increasing operation, so we don't have to worry about the inequality flipping. 2 square root of 3 minus 4 greater than n squared. Um, I'll subtract n squared from both sides. 
I'll add 4 and subtract 2 times the square root of 3. 4 minus 2 radical 3. Um, and then take the square root so that I know that absolute value of n is greater than the square root of 4 minus 2 radical 3. But this is a point where a calculator probably comes in handy. Um, what is 4 minus 2 times the square root of 3? I'll just do that on a calculator real quick here. It's about 0.5, and so if I take the square root of that, it's about 0.7. Back of the envelope here. Um, so anyway, this inequality down here in the denominator is true any time the absolute value of n is greater than about 0 0.7. So if n is in particular greater than or equal to 3, which we assume to be true, then we're going to know for sure that this inequality is in fact true for n greater than or equal to 3. So n greater than or equal to 3 makes this true. And therefore, we are justified in writing a less than symbol right here, which completes my proof. So when we get to the end of this process, we then sort of just read it from beginning to end. And the hard part about learning analysis is that very often your textbook problems, your textbook proofs are written this way too. And all of that thinking and verbalizing and all this work that happens over on the cocktail napkin, that all often doesn't make it onto the page of your textbook. Um, and so that's what's sometimes frustrating about learning analysis is that there's all of this little sort of nitty gritty detail work that happens off on the side that doesn't make it into the finished proof. Because when we read the finished proof, it'll say, we begin by assuming n is greater than or equal to 3. Then in particular, we know that n is greater than the square root of 3 minus 1. And then you might say, where in the world did that come from? Um, because you didn't see the cocktail napkin that we had written down here before. right? But then when we make this substitution, we know that 1 over n squared plus n plus 1 is less than 1 over n squared plus when we substitute this number in for n. Right? We get this. Um, and then we know that this denominator is less than that denominator for all n that are greater than or equal to 0 0.7. But in particular, greater than or equal to 3 makes that work just fine. Uh, and so we know this fraction is less than that fraction, which is equal to this fraction. And so when you read it from left to right, 1 over n squared plus n minus 1 is less than 2 over n squared. And we're done. So there's that big difference between solving an inequality and proving an inequality. Solving happens using the processes that you're probably familiar with from your algebra background, right? And it happens usually in analysis. It happens off on a piece of scratch paper or on a napkin somewhere, right? Um, and then it's when you go to prove an inequality that you work from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, usually. You know, taking a quantity like the one we have here and asking, how do I replace this quantity with something which is larger in this case? Because we're proving a less than inequality. Um, and then when I do, how do I know it's larger? Is it always larger? Because this is not actually always larger unless we knew that n was greater than the square root of 3 minus 1, which we did know. And so in the proof, we would write this is less than this because this denominator is greater than that denominator for all n greater than or equal to the square root of 3 minus 1, and therefore n is greater than or equal to 3. Make it true. right? So in the proof, we would read this from left to right and get it. But all of those steps are just mysterious unless you have all that scratch work off on the side that sort of convinced yourself why each one was true.